Everything is never, ever done. There's no clear line between one season, one year, and the other, but Junior Days are as good as we're going to get as far as marking the next March for 2025 now. And that's coming up this weekend. Uh, something we've been talking about previewing uh, basically since the start of the new year. And now Sean Fitz and Ryan Snyder working tirelessly to get the information about who's going to be here for Penn State's first Junior Day. I'm Thomas Frank Carr. As I mentioned, these guys here, the experts in Penn State recruiting, Sean Fitz over here and Ryan Snyder below me. Gentlemen, welcome to the show. Ryan, different location today. Yeah, wife's out of town means I got to get the kids to school, which means I did not put the heater on in the basement, <laughs> which means I am scrambling to make a setup here in my bedroom quick. So if I'm looking over here constantly, it's because this desk is not big enough for a laptop, a camera and a microphone. So hope you guys can hear me. All right. I'll try and look at the camera as much as I can, but uh, I also need to see some information on my laptop. The good thing is uh, you have two excellent setups. This one looks just as good as the basement. Fitz is in his normal position. He's doing his normal thing. Um, uh, just curious, uh, how do you feel about this junior day heading into it, just kind of from a broad view of setting the scene for us with this group of players that Penn State's going to have on campus this weekend? Well, the broad view is that Ryan has absolutely rocked it this week. He's got uh, confirmations from, uh, what, approaching 50 45. now, right? 45? 45, 45 yeah, is approaching 50. We're, we're it'll be 50 yet. soon, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, of course, there is weather on the horizon, which, you know, it's January in State College, Pennsylvania. That's what you get. Um, but it shouldn't be uh, as such that it'll deter too many people. There might be some flights canceled. There might be some issues that guys run across. But, uh, you know, they've, they've put it together pretty well in terms of, uh, you know, just from guys all over the place, guys in certain positions. Um, I, I think it's a really good group. Like I do. Um, and it's, it's a lot of 2025. Like sometimes we get into these things and there's a lot of like the, the 26 and the 27, the, the underclassmen that don't really move the needle as much, but I think this is a really good group right here. Um, and then you, you, what you do with junior days is you always combine it with the guys that you got on campus in the fall. And then you look at where those guys that you got on campus, you know, are going in January. And, you know, a lot of these guys are return visitors. So it's about the relationships. It's about getting these guys back into school or getting these guys back to campus. And I think they've done a nice job with that. Yeah, that's um, we're going to be talking about that uh, to for most of the show is some of the names some of the interesting people that are going to be trying to make it to campus with with that weather. We're also going to be talking in just a couple minutes about some recent offers that are going out um, a couple of different positions we're going to highlight. But Ryan, coming back to you, as Fitz said, you've been doing a lot of work here on this class confirming who's here. Uh, your overview, your thoughts on what's coming up this weekend. Yeah, good amount of talent. The list keeps growing. I think it's 20 three scholarship guys out of the 45 or so so right around half and i would expect after this weekend you know a handful of these guys who who don't currently have an offer will will have an offer from the staff but it, it's a handful of really important players right if, if you follow us on the site even follow us here on youtube you know, we've talked about a lot of these guys you know as as top three four five at their position you know players that you know, i think penn state would, would would take tomorrow if they wanted to commit so we'll get into some of those names here in a little bit but i think you know if, if they're able to keep the pace for these next two junior days and and stack the talent that they've had or that expected at least to, to come this weekend uh, penn state will be very happy with uh w their results here moving forward so from what i hear and what i remember kind of business as usual for Penn State that they're doing very well in the recruiting sector and 10 and 2 and losing to Michigan and Ohio State isn't killing them as it seems like some people think it is they're still a highly respected program and uh also just the tectonics of college football's landscape shifting underneath everybody fits are, are they maintaining what they've been able to do over the last couple of years of getting quality talent interested in the program uh for these junior days yeah, I didn't pull last year's January junior days, but the list is comparable. Like I'm just yeah. looking at it right now and there's a lot of good guys on here. And and I think that people don't understand how early it is in 2025. You know, you kind of think, okay, 24 is signed on to the next batch of free agents or whatever you want to call them in 2025. And it's, um, it's, it's not quite that. Like you look at the guys that they've uh, offered so far and they have a ton of offers out. They always do. Um, but now you're starting to get into... I would say I would say more precise evaluations because you have all the junior or you have a lot of the junior film. You're getting a chance to see these kids on campus. We're going to talk about new offers and stuff like that in, in a second here. But like this is 
this this cycle is still in its infancy as mm-hmm. as far as i say I, and i just messed that word up so <laughs> a terrible job uh bring home that point um but you look at the at the group that they have um coming in this weekend and i think it's very comparable what they've done in the past i don't think the I, it, it's not these the, the the everything is burning the elmo uh jeff that everything is burning uh, yeah. because they lost to michigan and ohio state no will miss of course uh the the feeling of coming off that loss to Ole miss i think it is part of the perspective from Penn State fans of how poor they think that season went. But generally, I just I think it's important to kind of reinforce in some of these moments that, you know, they are doing what they do uh, on the recruiting phase. And you, if you uh, maybe someday you want to go to a Penn State Junior Day, well, you need to stand out on film. And if you want to do that, uh, you know, being a great football player, it's a lot about what genetics give you, but you want to maximize your potential. MMA FX can help you do that, especially if you're a defensive lineman, a linebacker, or a wide receiver. If you've got to get off a block, you've got to get off press, any of those things where you need to use your hands to defeat blocks, this is the only comprehensive hand fighting program video set for football players available, and everybody is using it. Everyone from the Giants, the Texans, Oklahoma, Washington in the college football playoff, Penn State, Western Kentucky, all of the James Franklin coaching tree has been using this. So check it out. If you're a high school football player, you're a high school football coach, and you want to give your team an edge on the football field, Bruce Lombard of Lombard MMA can help. He developed this program with uh, the help of football players over the last 10 years, and he's uh, refined this to football specific moves from MMA. So these that's what MMA FX is. It's football specific moves from hand fighting experts and from the place that hand fighting is the most important, which is in mixed martial arts. So gain an edge on the football field. Be the best hand fighter you can be. You can contact Bruce at MMAFX.net or uh, you can visit him MMAFX.net. But if you're just like, okay, I'm in, I want to get uh, this this program for my team or for my son, I got a great deal for you. Hopefully you didn't put in uh, the input code yet because I've got a code for you, 15BWI, to get 15% off at LombardMMA.com backslash shop. He extended that through the holiday season here into January because he, here's the thing, Bruce is an awesome dude. He is deadly and I'm scared of him, but he is one of the nicest people I've ever met and he really wants to help you out. So uh, 15% off at LombardMMA, uh, LombardMMA.com backslash shop. There you go, Fitz. I just ruined backslash with a nice uh, spittle there. Uh, guys, we're going to get into some of those new offers that you mentioned earlier. And I, I want to get your thoughts. Uh, first off, th- college football and recruiting and the rules are always changing. So there is some new rules that we have to go over in terms of the differences between last year and this year. Uh, who put that on the rundown? I want to go to the person who put that on. So I'm getting the right uh, fits. So yeah. what do we what do we need to know here? Actually, I think Ryan put the rule thing there. Um, but uh, yeah, there's a, there's a change this year where as you go out on the road in January, it used to be, you know, actually before the December signing period used to be you, you try and close on all your guys. You do what you do do now in December. You did that in January. Now it's the, like all those guys are signed. So what do you do? You just keep going and bouncing the schools that you know, doing the regional thing and everything like that. And they've made some moves here where they, in, Jan- in April 2023, they made it, uh, the change that allowed coaches to have extended conversations with juniors, so 2025 prospects. So you're seeing um, pictures of uh, Phil Troutwine with Michael Carroll. You know, th- th- these guys that you may already know in 2025, they're getting a chance to sit down with them. They couldn't do that um, at, at this time last year. So it probably accelerates the cycle a little bit, accelerates the evaluation. It gives you you know, a little bit more purpose in terms of going out on the road if you're a coach right now, because uh, it used to be, you know, uh, he's going to go to uh, Central Bucks East, but he's also going to hit LaSalle. He's going to hit all those schools in Bucks County. He's going to go to wherever he needs to be as a regional recruiter. Now you can sort of zero in because, I mean, let's be honest, these guys, a lot of these guys, we we understand who they are at this point, because it's, it's not, it's not a situation where you're discovering a ton of guys. Now, on the flip side, I'll talk about that in a second, that uh, it's still a great opportunity to, to size some guys up, to talk mm-hmm. to them, to get their personality and to to actually eventually offer them as they're doing right now. Uh, so, Ryan, uh, when it comes to this uh, situation with some of the, the recent offers, where do you want to start? 
um, because you you both have been very active of of finding these on Twitter and and making sure that fans know about them and and you know kind of putting them out there. What catches your eye in terms of maybe a storyline or a thread between all of these? Uh, I would say two things. Uh, I would say there's two broad topics to discuss. One, running backs because they already have two running backs committed, yet mm -hmm. they continue to recruit others. The offer just went out the other day. We'll get in him in a second. And then two, offensive line. Uh, Penn State signed two really good offensive line classes the past two years. And when I look at this cycle, I think a few of the guys that we assume Troutwine would have would have heavily pursued, a few of them are already kind of off the board. Um, you know, Will Black committed to Notre Dame a few weeks back. Owen Strabig uh, out of – uh, Wisconsin kind of yeah. didn't include Penn State among his top schools. Of course, they had Jalen Matthews committed. He then decommitted. You know, maybe they can circle back there, but you know, guys committing for a second time. What I can only think of Micah and Matthias Barnwell. I think are the only two I can, off the top of my head, at least that that throw Jamil Collard at that. you, but we're not going to go that. Far. <laughs> yeah, that's well way back. Uh, so my my point just with that is it's it's going to be hard with him and we've seen trout out on the road here last couple of weeks, really kind of expanding his board. I'm, I'm not sure how many offers he's handed out, but it's probably about four or five, we'll say a half dozen or so, you know, mm -hmm. offensive linemen that have, that have picked up offers in recent weeks. So he's clearly expanding the board, trying to get guys up here for junior days and, you know, continuing that evaluation. I, I think those are probably the two big takeaways. Uh, Fitz on that note with Phil Troutwine, a lot of these guys also not regional prospect. Does that play into uh, what Ryan is talking about with some of the regional guys going elsewhere? Or is that Penn State trying to broaden just generally the net and go a little bit more national trying to find some of these guys? Broaden the net. I mean, you look at last spring and it felt like we were writing about a different offensive lineman visiting every day. Like that's how they do it. Like they go out and they find these guys and they develop these relationships and sort of make them feel as if they are wanted, I mean, you're, you're going to offer what 50 offensive linemen or probably more than that. And you're only going to take five. So you got to figure out, you got to, you know, cycle through, um, you know, cycle through and, and, and get, get it through the, the funnel there to see who's going to be the actual targets. But you still want to get these guys on campus. You still want to get them around your coaches, see what they're like, um, see how they measure up. I mean, it, trout wine, there was, there was no rhyme or reason to, um, his offers this week. He was in Iowa with uh, with Will Tompkins, Michael Gibbs in North Carolina, Jackson Lloyd in California, Isaiah Souls, um, who was who camped last year in Kentucky. So there, uh, and also so here's the juxtaposition here. Isaac Souls is a six two guard. Uh, Jack Lang is a six eight two seventy five tackle in Missouri. You know, like the, he's not going out and looking for certain things. I, think I don't know which to, one is more shocking, six two or six eight. I, I don't at this point. <laughs> It's it's hard to say. It's hard. You got to be a really good player to to be at both of those sizes. Like the, you're, mm -hmm. you're like it, it's the bell curve, you know. Um, so um, it, it, it's he's not looking for one thing, but he's looking at these guys that he's already started relationships with and and trying to find the best one. So we're we're getting there in terms of evaluation. We're getting there. And to be honest with you, I think he's throwing a lot of these out there, hoping that they come to camp because that's when you get your best evaluation of them. Um, you can talk about film and. Um, everybody says the film doesn't lie. Film lies a lot. Like in, in high school, <laughs> highlight film, lies film a too. Lot. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it gives you a chance to, to get these, uh, these firsthand looks. Some places have spring football. A lot of places don't. Um, and that's an issue. So you're just trying to, to get that as wide as possible by the time you get to, um, June, um, try and bring those guys in for the early camps. We talked about uh, a bunch of those guys last year that, uh, that were able to, to come in and, and eventually, camp for their offers essentially so uh that's kind of i think i think that's where i see that this offensive line class last year another very important um part of this is that last year at this time garrett sexton and caleb brewer did not have offers i mean that's that's to this this whole evaluation of offensive linemen is absolutely a marathon. Egan Boyer just picked us up a year ago last week. So half of your offensive mm. line class didn't have offers at this time last year. So if they haven't gotten uh, Jalen Matthews or Will Black or whoever, hey, there's going to be guys out there that pop up on the radar. Yeah, and, and Ryan, that was kind of what I was just wanted to transition ask you about in terms of um, kind of setting the board for don't panic. Because it seems like offensive lineman development and and there's a lot of guys that go from 6'2 to 6'6 in high school when they hit that second growth spurt so um I, are you like how do you calibrate offensive line recruiting given what Fitz just said and kind of keeping pace with okay so these guys are off the board but 
um, you know, there's more names coming up and, and Penn State has still has an opportunity to find guys to extend this run they've been on that you mentioned earlier. Mm-hmm. Um, a couple of things. I, the region, I wouldn't say is as deep as maybe it has been in the past as far as definitely an offensive tackle, it feels like, because a couple of those guys, like I like I mentioned earlier, they, they, were, they were more tackle prospects. Um, one other thing I would add, too, to that is, Oh shoot, Sean! Sean, you were hitting on all the different spots he's been. You know, all the different states. Uh, that that's a big. I don't want to say difference because they, they 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 go all over the place. But it feels like Trout's just been hitting one or two schools here, one or two schools here, one or two schools here, instead of doing more of that regional. And I think that speaks a lot to the change in this rule and and how coaches are going to attack that here moving forward. Because again. You know, Sean, Sean was saying earlier, you know, guys would do a lot more regional schools in previous years where where now it feels like they're specifically targeting different players. And I know that wasn't answering your question there, T. Frank, but I wanted to make sure I got that point in there. As far as offensive tackle, offensive line recruiting, I don't want to say there's a ton of guys out there, right? Because there's only so many six, uh, six, 280, 280 pound quality offensive tackles out there. But Penn State, I think, has enough cachet that that they will be able to pull their weight there. And a lot of these guys that are offering, they're, they're certainly going to want them to visit once or twice. They're absolutely going to want them to camp down the road. I mean, for, for one other guy that Sean didn't mention, Connor, is it Connor Cardi, I believe it is, out of Texas? He just picked up an offer, I think it was on January 4th, and he's already set a, a visit for Penn State later later this year. So um, it, a lot of these offers are really trying to get guys on campus. That's the main thing. Start that process, get one visit in here, and see where things go. Uh, I, I do want to circle back to the running back conversation, Fitz. Um, two running backs already in the class. So being I don't know if this is being aggressive, if this is being uh, you know covering your bases, what it is. Uh, I made the joke however long it was ago at this point when Tyke Hayes committed that, that J1 Sider could basically take 2025 off at this point. Clearly he isn't. So how do you read the, the new offers going out? Yeah. And I'm going to try and keep it short because I see I'm lagging. I apologize. Um, I think that he's keeping his options open because you look at 2025 on the field and he's probably not going to have Nick Singleton and Katron Allen. So you need to replenish the room as much as possible so keep your options open things are good with tyke hayes things are good with keandre barker um but you can keep those things open and hey go after elite guys they, the standard is very high in that running back room because of the way that j1 sider is recruited visited alvin henderson this week offered james simon louisiana uh jeffrey overton was the all met uh, offensive player of the year in northern virginia so like there are guys out there that can play and he's not uh i don't think he's he's comfortable to sit back and let uh you know s- sort of let that take shape he He'd rather be aggressive and go after him. A couple of things here in the chat. The first we're going to get to Julian Rodriguez asks, and he says, morning guys question. Do you all think Abdul Carter will have a big bounce back season in 2024? Um, he got off to a bit of a rough start. And I think tackling was maybe one thing you could say throughout the season wasn't super consistent, but I wouldn't say Abdul Carter had a bad year. I think he had a bad public perception based on his start. But do either of you think that Abdul had a uh, needed to bounce back next year in the way he performed? Uh, Ryan, what do you think? Uh, maybe a little bit of a sophomore slump, I guess you could say. But it's all there. He just has to put kind of put it together a little bit more, be a little more consistent in some ways. But I mean, the guy's a freak, right? I mean, it's it depends on how you want to look at it. I mean, look, they're obviously going to lose Curtis uh, Curtis Jacob. They already have lost Curtis Jacob, so you know the what what kind of role he'll have next year, and and you know the different situations that Tom Allen puts him in. I'm not too worried about him, you know, uh, not reaching a, a different standard, right? I mean, he had a heck of a first year there, but uh, he's a freak, and he's going to be a top NFL guy no matter what. Uh, Fitz, maybe I can uh, maybe. First off, just what, what do you think of the question? What's your answer to the question here? I, I think it's versus expectations. Like he was expected to have an all American type year. He didn't like uh, and, and he fell short of expectations. I wouldn't call it a bad year, but uh, he fell short of the expectations set for him for set within the program, all that stuff. So, um, yeah, I think it's all it's all there. Um, I think we're going to see him rush the pass for more in 2024, which I'm excited to see. Yeah, a couple things here that I just, you know, from my perspective, looking at some of the data and watching him on film, 28% missed tackle rate is that would be the area I'd say, mm. like even in the bowl game against Ole Miss, you want to see him bring those players down more so than I know he strings the play out even on the the, the bananas pitch play where he comes from the backside and almost tackles Quinchon Judkins. So missed tackles are part of the part of his story uh, this past season. But as Fitz mentioned, rushing the passer. Um, 
you know, 112 total pass rushing snaps, blitzes, and coming off the edge. And he got uh, pressure on almost 30% of those. That's bananas, like, from a guy in that perspective. So I, I agree. And, and, you know, that whole... I don't think Micah Parsons was elite his second year either. Like, we have this idea that Micah Parsons was this guy he is in the NFL his second season. He did things that were special. But if, again, if we're... if I think part of the Abdul Carter conversation is influenced by Micah Parsons and what he's become, not necessarily remembering exactly what 2019 was. Uh, Micah Parsons was still learning how to play in coverage in 2019, where they he was, you know, kind of learning to play linebacker still. Um, he made a lot of impact plays. Uh, that's, that's I think, the big difference is making a lot of impact plays behind the line of scrimmage. But um, a couple other things we need to get to. Philip wants to know what uh, Fitz's favorite anti-fragile uh, beer is, and I think... We'll find out when they sponsor the show. <laughs> so, you know, just wow. put that out there into the universe. That was T Frank that said that. I, I just answered in the chat, by the way, but I didn't have a specific favorite. So, um, no, Paula does a great job brewing down there. So I'm, I'm happy to support them um, because they support my, I don't want to say support my habit, but I'm, I'm I was going to say, where are you going with that, buddy? <laughs> I, hey, I, I, I'll be honest with you. My persona drinks a lot more than I do. So um, no, it's uh, that's the street cred you want to have, though. Like you want to have the cred of yes, being. I want people to think I'm an alcoholic. Mm, I, that's, fun. Uh, that's I was going with fun. Much. I was going with a good time. Not necessarily no shop local <laughs> is what I. That's, that's that's where I go with that. Uh, Stephen Light says the BWI team still doing it here through the cold and the snow. Thank you. Appreciate you being here, Stephen Light. Um, and I appreciate everyone who sponsors the show and supports the show. Uh, I'd love for that uh, to grow and be very local. I'd love to have a bunch of local people here on the show. That's why I made that joke. I would love this show to be a part of the community. But I always appreciate our sponsors wherever they come from. And one of them that has been uh, with us for a very long time is My Perfect Franchise. If you want to determine the next stage of your life, you want to pursue your American dream, check out Andy Ludicky and My Perfect Franchise. He's a franchise consultant with extensive experience placing people uh, like you with the perfect franchise to manage. And I actually had a chance to catch up with Andy and talk with him uh, this week. And some of the things he was talking about, some of the in the business side of things. So I find that the best people at what they do are nerds about their subject. Like the best football players in the world are absolute football nerds. Andy is a business nerd. So he wants to know the latest on all of these different trends. Fitness and health is very big. Uh, the, the brand Lindora. I, I don't, I, you know, he told me all about it. I don't remember all the specifics, but that's why you need to talk to Andy because Andy has all the answers for you. Uh, also, we have a uh, B -W BWI message board member who has taken the plunge and has gotten his own business through Andy and this consultation service. Brian Malley owns a painting business. So uh, they're about in their third week right now is what um, Andy said. So if you're interested, you want to make money and determine your own future, check out My Perfect Franchise. Contact Andy at MyPerfectFranchise.net. That's Andy at MyPerfectFranchise.net or 404-973-9901. That's 404-973-9901. Appreciate Andy being a supporter of the show. Uh, so let's get into the biggest part of today. That is Junior Days. And uh, this is all, I always have fun with the names and uh, the highlights and getting the first stage of getting to know these players. So couple 2025 guys that I have here to highlight, a couple 2026 guys to highlight. Ryan, where do you want to start with the junior day list? Uh, let's start with the top guy, right? The the one that I think is incredibly important for Penn State, especially when you look at the region, and that would be Trent Wilson, defensive lineman. Out of Wise uh, in Maryland, 6'3", 260. Right now he's ranked 26 by 1-3. You know, if he, if he were to stay that high, not so sure that he will. But if he were – that would make him a five-star prospect down the road. I mean, if you look Why at the industry rate. Just curious. Ah, well, just if you look at everybody else, it's it's substantially lower. You know, and, and the trend, okay. I mean, obviously Charles is incredibly high on him, but, um, you know, I'm just looking at the trends of what other people think. And usually, if you look over the course of a year, they all kind of even out in the end. So, okay. um, I mean, look, he's still a top 100 kind of prospect, right? Whether he's a five-star or not, I just, it's just incredibly hard for guys to, to become five-stars. So I'm trying to paint that picture and get excitement while also taming expectations, if that makes sense. Um, totally. But look, I mean, it's, he's it's incredibly hard for someone to be a four star prospect and people have forgotten. Right. That. right. <laughs> so anyway, I mean, I look, there's two guys in the region, right. That I think I don't want to call them must lands, 
But like getting one of them, I think is incredibly important for Deion Barnes. And that's Trent Wilson from Wise, as I mentioned. And then obviously Maxwell, uh, Maxwell Roy, St. Joseph's Prep, uh, two very good defensive tackles. And when you look at the region, there's not a ton of those guys that are on their level. So I think they really got to try and get one of those guys. And Trent's the one who's been the most consistent visitor, who's been consistently open about the fact that he's really high on Penn State. And, uh, you know, they need difference makers in there. They, they have Liam Andrews, of course. Uh, he's going to need some time, you know, to, to kind of progress as a defensive lineman. He's very good. He's got everything you want there, but he's going to need time to work on technique. I mean, Trent Wilson's been kind of working on that technique since he was a freshman, right? So I'm not saying he would come in and play right away or anything like that, but this is a guy who is a bona fide, absolute, uh, you know, top 10 kind of defensive tackle. And then you look at the region, you know, that's not, that's not always common. Uh, you, you get a lot more of that yeah. down south uh, and, you know, sometimes out west. So when you have a, a top player like him in the area, who's consistently visited, who seems very high on Penn State. You know, everything looks pretty good for for PSU to get an official visit down the road, things like that. Uh, th that makes him just incredibly important. I, I think he's one of the five most important defensive players. Would you agree with that, Sean? I mean, it's hard. I know we're, we're still evaluating it. But, like, if you're looking at defensive players right now, I think he would be top five on Penn State's board. That's tough, man, because uh, we, we like, you know how I feel about early rankings. Like, you know, know how I feel with with especially with guys that are, you know, a lot of these guys play. He he was at St. Francis. So like his profile was a bit amplified there. Um, So I, I think he's an important target. But I, I I hesitate to jump too far to top of the board guys in January 2025. Like that's okay. kind of where I'm at with that. So um, I think he's I, I agree with you. I think he's he's going to fall. It doesn't mean a bad player. But I think he's going to uh, to to fall and maybe not be the the five star guy that people were hoping for. Um, as you mentioned, incredibly incredibly hard to be a five star. Very hard to be a top one hundred player as well. So, mm -hmm. um, I, but I would agree that he's he's a priority right now. I, it's it's interesting because you look at on the defensive line, and I apologize if I'm lagging again here. Um, nope, but um, you look at the defensive line, and those guys are still in development in terms of their bodies, in terms of their measurements, in terms of all that kind of stuff, and and, and that can change a lot between now and then. Gilliam Cook did not have offers at this time last year. Malachi Williams just picked up his at this time last year. So, like, it's still a developmental thing. And those guys that you're asking to play at 6'3", six, 6'4", six, are not going to be as advanced physically as the guys that are going to be there that can can wreck a game at 6'1". So, yeah. um, you look, I, I think a great example of this, Emmett Laws went to Virginia Tech last year um, from, from uh, I believe, DeMatha, right? Yes, um, one of my favorites. Was, he was awesome. Like he was yep. awesome, but he's also five eleven, and that's going to hinder his recruitment. Like he was a really, really dynamite player. And then when you get to the next level, everybody's bigger and everybody's learned to move in that same way. So like the, a lot of these guys that pop up on, on the, uh, the early radar are because they're really good football players that probably have a ceiling because of their size. Um, yep. And I think that that's kind of what we're seeing on the defensive line is how you make that transition from, guys that were, you know, promising prospects as sophomores to guys that can actually play and be really good players in college as juniors and seniors. So I think the offensive line, especially offense, offensive tackle has the uh, a strong parallel and, and might be the exact same story of uh, you got to find the right player with the right development curve. Because I also think like you look at some guys that are massive early, don't always necessarily move the best. And Penn State wants guys that can move at every position. So you you might see a guy who is, you know, six foot five, 290 pounds as a sophomore, and maybe that actually doesn't translate to the next level. There are certain guys early on that are identified as these five stars that we talk about that, you know, uh, have both of those things, and it's clear they're going to translate to the next level or as clear as it can be. But the development that you guys are both talking about of a guy who has the right height, measurables and can grow into what you want to be i think that's just penn state is always trying to find that guy specifically and those guys it fits those guys don't normally show up the same way until they're juniors or seniors because they're developing on that path uh at, you know that's the development curve yeah everybody wants commitments right now like and that's like we talk about this because we're gonna we're gonna have the same conversation when we get into may and there hasn't been a commitment for a couple of weeks and it's like up oh, we're you know why why isn't penn state have any momentum right now then you get back into june and june takes care of it usually july as well somebody mentioned uh ta cunningham in the chat i mean that's a great example like you he can look like an absolute stud as a freshman but then what's going to happen the rest of the time the thing that ta has to fall back on is that he's what six six two seventy 
whatever it is. Like there, there aren't too many of those guys walking around. So, um, so like that is a, that is a situation where you look at, he, Hey, he's a potential five-star and all of a sudden it doesn't add up. I mean, you look at Ohio state just took Zaheer Mathis. Zaheer Mathis looked like the next big thing coming out of Philly. Um, he's got a lot of work to do. Like he, you look at his junior film, he's got a long ways to go. Um, so like there, there's kind of where I'm at with, with, especially with the defense, with the bigger guys. And, and it's funny cause I had this conversation, um, last week with someone, um, not a Penn state, but like they're wondering if the big receiver is dead because six, four, six, five, how hard it is to play that position at six, four, six, five. Everybody wants Calvin Johnson, obviously, but most guys are not Calvin Johnson. Uh, in fact, exclusively everyone is not Calvin Johnson. Um, so <laughs> yeah. getting in there, getting in and out of breaks and doing, doing all the things that you need to do as a receiver. I mean, you look at, at the top receiving groups around the country and a lot of those are, are right around six, two, maybe like an yeah. a six, one, six, two is an average there, which is still pretty tall, but it's not the six, four, six, five guy that I think people want to balance with. Every time you take a slot guy, you take a guy that's six, five, like that's not, yeah. I don't, I don't think that's necessarily the way the, the correct Avenue anymore. Yeah. X receivers, you know, those kind of that body type you're talking about, it, they are Marvin Harrison Jr. And you got to have those special skills to really pop as, as that player, as you pointed out, talking about Calvin Johnson. Uh, Ryan, I do think you make a good point, though, about going back to Trent Wilson and having select people in the region that kind of have this profile in this build. Um, I think that's a, that's a great point about, you know, availability. We always talk about availability of some of these better players in the region. Who's another player on the list for junior days that's coming up that you want to highlight here that has, you know, uh, maybe not the similar feel as Trent Wilson, but somebody else that you think is important this weekend? Um, uh, I guess we'll go with Anthony Saka, maybe the uh, linebacker out of St. Joseph's Prep. I mean, where two years ago, I mean, a year and a year ago, I guess we'll say, you know, felt felt pretty good that, that Saka was going to be a top guy for Penn State. And I still think they're they're going to pursue him pretty hard. But they, they have a challenge here. Uh, Notre Dame is absolutely in the mix. Michigan's going to host him here uh, the weekend after. So January 27th, Ohio State's got him on campus a couple times. I mean, for, for a legacy player, he at least when I compare to a lot of other legacies in recent years and then guys for this upcoming class that we've got to know. I mean, he, he certainly seems to be pretty open. Uh, to to go in somewhere else. So this is the first time he's been on campus really since October 2022. So big visit here. How it relates with Tom Allen's important, you know. But the also the other thing I'd say here is that this this linebacker board is incredibly deep for 2025. You know, we're talking about top prospects for for Penn State's defense. Well, they have. I mean, DJ McClary is absolutely. He'd be another guy to have in my top five, Sean. Although I don't know if we, we want to uh, go that far against. You know, with the B and J. Ryan, you want to come back tomorrow and do a top five list? Five, a no. top five Friday? <laughs> no, definitely it. not. But but McClary is definitely up there too, is, is my point. Yeah. So but there's a lot of others too. Uh and and you know, if you if you're a subscriber and you see our list, I mean this this weekend's incredibly deep with linebackers. So that that has to shake out a little bit. I think there's a couple of guys who haven't visited yet that Penn State's incredibly high on and and players we may be discussing more more in the spring, but you know, that this linebacker class. The town in the region, the amount of guys who have visited so far, it's incredibly deep. So, you know, if they were to miss out on sack, I don't think it's the end of the world just because they are absolutely – I feel pretty confident they're going to get three pretty good linebackers in this class. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, I mean, you know, Penn State fans uh, don't like it when legacy prospects go elsewhere, and, and this is yeah. a guy who might do that. Fitz, I just – if you're watching here on the YouTube channel, um, he's big, big. What position is he like? Where where do you see him fitting in? Because you know, there's uh, I don't want to go too far down the rabbit hole and, and speculate too much, but he's more. I know he started as a safety. He looks more like a linebacker and hybrid sort of guy with how thick he is and how early in his development he is. So where where does he play for Penn State? Do you think? And do you think he has the athleticism to play kind of that uh, box linebacker, maybe Sam role? I'm I'm glad you said that because he he does look like if he got into like the right program and everything like that he could he could just blow up still and yeah. and even play end, um, but no I mean I think he's he's probably a will he's got he's got experience playing in space. Um, it, it's going to be interesting because you look at the the linebacker class that they took last year with a couple of mics. Um, you've got DJ McClary who's probably a Mike. Um, mm -hmm. I would guess so. Um, you've got Alex Tash, um, who's probably a will, uh, will Mike. There's, there's a lot of box guys, um, that are coming through the system right now. Uh, Brett Clatterball is going to visit this weekend. He's a, I think he's a Mike too. Um, so you, you, I don't want to call it a log jam, but there's a lot of guys that are, they're fitting that profile. 
Um, so I think he's versatile enough to to do that. Like he has the experience playing in sa- in space as a safety. Is he a Sam? I don't know that he's going to stay that small. Like we, that was the that was always the argument. He wanted to play safety, right, Ryan? That was that mm-hmm. was his thing. He's, mm-hmm. I mean, nature has a a say in all of this. You know, it's a, it's one thing the coaches say. It's one thing for the kids to say. It. Nature's going to say it eventually for you. Um, so I think he's he's going to end up at linebacker. I'm I, I'm not sure if that's um you know if if he's a guy that plays in space and i'm interested to see what tom allen does with his linebackers i don't think it's terribly different from what uh, manny diaz did but yeah. uh, you have an opportunity there to maybe play in a little bit more space in in the box if that makes sense yeah and uh, by the way that's going to be something i'm coming up with uh focusing a lot on the secondary with tom allen but as you dig deeper some of the things he did in the front seven different than what he did in the past year so the that that 11th defender however you want to hybrid that out that's something we're going to be taking a look at here uh, when I get the time, <laughs> when we're do- when we're not doing the live shows and getting all these highlights and everything. Uh, you mentioned Brett Clatterbaugh. Let's go back and let's talk about linebackers. Let's take a look at Brett Clatterbaugh. Fitz, come back to you about Clatterbaugh. Tell me a little bit more about him to, to set us up. Wrestling background, um, you know, plays a little bit on the defensive line. Uh, so it's it's tough to he's he's tough to tough projection. I, I have him as a Mike, but, uh, you know, he's a, he's a guy that, uh, I think fits the profile of some of the guys they brought in the past. Um, very curious where Penn state sits in the mix. He's been up several times. I feel like he might be a Brent Pry type, you know, more so than a Manny type. And yeah, obviously Manny's not here anymore, but, uh, it's, it, it's going to be interesting to see where he plays and how he grows. Cause he's a big kid and, and as a wrestler, and that's the thing we, we talk about how great wrestling is for, for some of these guys in terms of leverage and all that kind of stuff, but they're also second weight. So like, how big is this kid going to get? Is he going to be defensive end? So, uh, I think he's, he's in that, on that assembly line, he's the Mike to, to DN type, uh, type of kid. Zariah Fisher's working out pretty well for Penn State. Ryan, uh, and w- what do we need to know about Clatterball and the relationships and some of the other stuff here with uh, Penn State and, and uh, uh, Clatterball coming up for the junior day? I would say Clemson, Va Tech. Uh, definitely agree with Sean. He's a Brent, he's a Brent Pride kind of kid. I, I would, I think those two probably have a little bit of an edge on Penn State right now, but uh, Nilly Lions are certainly in the mix. I think, I think with him, it's really going to maybe depend on when he commits because we're watching one or two other guys who I think could, could make a move a little bit sooner. So we'll see. Uh, it definitely feels like a Mike DN guy. I totally agree with Sean on that one. I, right now, I just, I'm not too confident that, that Brett would be uh, somebody who signs with Penn state down the road. So you're saying he's not in your top five defensive players. No, no. <laughs> I, I mean, he's a good player. I like Brett Cottaball a lot, but you know, I would, I would have Alex Tash uh, up there a little bit, a little bit higher on the board. It's um it's interesting. Like you guys are talking about, and we're we're learning a little bit more about this linebacker group. And uh, some years you have guys that are <laughs> defensive ends that are obviously going to be linebackers in Tony Rojas. Some years you have guys that you don't know if they're going to be able to play in the box eventually. And now we got some big kids uh, uh on this linebacker board. So just the 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 interesting part to me is like the variety each year. Uh, and this and, guy and certainly. Got, oh, sorry, right. and they've got. Uh... A bunch of guys nationally that they're going after too that, that are kind of fit the bill i don't want to call them sams but more athletic guys we'll, we'll say that um that yeah. uh veer away from the mic uh the mic d end as more of a safety rover type guy and that's uh i think i think that's what they need like they look you look at what they took in last year and what they've they've got on the roster i think that they need more of those guys uh this speaking of national guy who's been all over the place uh and is just an interesting watch on film here uh we've seen him before but beckham kritza um ryan you were talking about why this is a very important visit even though he's committed so why is this a very important visit despite he already being committed to penn state uh yeah i just thought it was notable to mention that that he's come coming up you know with, with the coaching change and all that i mean obviously he's gotten around cold a little bit or he's spoken with him I, i'm not sure if cold made it out there yet um especially with it being january and you know they, they can talk now in january but uh, just just getting him back up here with a new OC. Obviously, he commits right before Mike Yurchich is fired and all that stuff. So, you know, having him come out from Colorado, notable uh, as well. You know, just just how often can guys from the from the West Coast, even when they're committed, you know, make it back out here for a consistent visit? So, I, I feel like that's notable. And you know, they have a handful of good wide receivers coming into town. It's always good when you have a quarterback uh, committed already there to to kind of recruit. He, he's one of a couple. Um, committed guys who are going to be here this weekend. I expect Brady O'Hara from Pittsburgh to be here and, and Messiah Mickens as well, you know, of course, from Harrisburg 2026 guys. So uh, I just think I just thought it was notable to mention that, you know, he, he will be here this weekend. And, um, you know, I'm not sure if they've if he's met Colton yet in person, but he's certainly going to uh, spend an extended period with him this weekend. 
Fitz, what are your thoughts here uh, on Kritza and uh, just the relationship and the fit and all those things through this transition? Very interesting because you're probably going to continue to push for Matt Zoller's pretty hard. Um, the in-state quarterback, the in-state four-star quarterback. Um, I do think that they're going to try and take two if they can. Um, you've got this little window there where you took him essentially before there was an offensive coordinator in place. Um, so that, 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 that helps. Um, I'm very curious to see how this, this all plays out, but uh, he's a guy that they like. I'll, I'll keep going back to it. They, they like him just as much as the, the other guys that they offered. I, I think there's a misconception that cause he's a three-star kid from, far away that they, you know, just kind of took him to take him. And I don't think that's the case. Um, mm -mm. But at the same time, you've got an in-state four star that, uh, that they're very high on. I mean, like they, they've been talking like how long have we been talking about Zollers, Ryan? Like it was way before he was since offered. The, since I went to that game. Mannheim township game. Yeah. yeah. So beginning I mean, of September. Was, uh, I mean, he was at the elite 11 last spring and uh, coach Abe came up and he's like, Hey, keep, keep an eye on this kid. So there have been people watching this guy for a while. And I think he's, I, I would say blown up. Um, I mean, his offer maybe, list hasn't yet, but it's about to. I mean, he's picked up five actually, offers in yeah, the last week. Actually, as much, but uh, yeah, he's uh, he's certainly a guy that I think Penn State is going to find like hard not to push for. We'll say that. Uh, and this is also considering they've got other 2025 quarterback prospects as well. And just I'm going to throw this back up here and, and just quick uh, analysis of uh, Beckham Kritza and why you got to take him seriously. His release is lightning fast. Just if you're watching here on the YouTube channel, watch how fast the ball gets out of his hand. He's got a strong arm, quick release, and quick feet. So despite the fact that he is very thin and needs to fill out, there are undeniably difference-making traits here. So like you, you again, as Fitz said, a three-star guy from far away, I think part of the evaluation process has been his inconsistency in play, uh, you know, because some of the transfers and things like that. But this is a dude that's got talent arm talent mm -hmm. for days so yeah. you know there's a reason Penn State wanted to take him despite all these other things going on uh around that particular position yeah he can uh, deal there's no doubt about it I mean he's uh he's definitely a guy that's uh, a, a project but a project worth taking on if you want to throw the ball for, for sure. sure so I mentioned earlier offensive linemen that maybe get a little bit too big too early um, and I don't think that's the case here with this one in 2026. This dude's been huge his whole life. Uh, another guy that I know we're highlighting here on the show, Tyler Merrill. Uh, we've seen him in person. We have uh, talked about him quite a bit. Uh, Fitz, wh what do you think of the relationship here and Merrill coming during uh, junior day a year early? Yeah, I think it's a big opportunity for Penn State to, uh, I don't, I don't want to say build on their lead, but establish themselves in a really good position there. I know that some other big schools are after him. I know he's, you know, he talked to Ohio State, talking to some some really, really good programs. But I don't want to say lock it down, but like Penn State's been very strong in the mid-state. Like they've done a really, really good job in Ryan's area. That's why we moved him there to, uh, to, to pick up those Harrisburg area kids. And uh, we saw him at the Elite 11 last year. He is a massive, massive kid. Um, he's going to continue to get better in terms of his footwork, in terms of his athleticism. Obviously, that's going to come along because he's very big very early. But at the same time, uh, he's, a, he's a guy that Penn State uh, has has settled on and really liked. I think if he, was a, if he was a 2025 prospect, they'd recruit him as well. So like that's a pretty good compliment for a kid that's uh, just coming off his sophomore year. Yeah, and I think even seeing him from the summer until these highlights, that that movement has gotten better. Because I was I was a little concerned at first watching him move in person and some of the stiffness, but he's he's worked on all of that. These highlights look pretty damn good. Yeah, Ryan, it, it, it's kind of sorry to cut hit, cut in here, but it's kind of like Cooper Cousins. Um, he mm -hmm. was a big kid to start with. Like the you know some of these guys, like uh, Egan Boyer, got here two hundred fifty pounds last week or last or this month. So like everybody's on a different path, but this is kind of the path that, that Cooper followed where he was great as a freshman and sophomore, and, but he was also huge. So you wanted to see if he's a giant guy that just pushed people around, or if he's a guy that, you know, can, can project to the next level. And I think Merrill's trending in that direction. What do we know? And what's the relationship like here with Tyler Merrill, Ryan? Uh, what yeah, do I mean, you know about him as the, as the, you know, as the guy that has a relationship with Penn State. Sorry. Yeah, I love the Cooper comparison. They're a little bit different players. I mean, obviously, I, I know what you were saying about that, but like they're very similar in that perspective of just uh, what we've seen from last year to this year. Um, he's He fits Penn State incredibly well, right? But you can also say that about Michigan. You can also say that about Notre Dame. You can also say that about Ohio State. And I think it'll come down to those four schools most likely 
um, you know, when it, when it's all said and done, he has family ties to Penn state. Grandfather's a diehard Penn state fan. I met him, um, when was it uh, beginning of September, uh, loves Penn state. But the other thing that too, with Merrill that I don't think a lot of people know about is he spent half his life in Germany. Uh, his, his father's it was in the military. So it's not like he grew up going to Beaver stadium, you know, going to games and, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, you know, he, he, again, likes Penn state, followed Penn state family leans Penn state, I guess you'd say. Um, but it's it's again it's it's not like a lot of other Central PA kids who you know been going to going up there for games since they since they were young. So we'll see how it plays out. He visited Penn, Ohio State twice. I do think that's very notable. Uh, one out there, I believe, in the summer, and then made sure to make it back there for a game earlier this year, or you know uh, back in November, I believe it was. So let's see where he goes here in the coming weeks. I do think this is a player Penn State should land. Uh, but that's again, if he, if he ended up at Michigan or Notre Dame, like. I, I would say, yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. So great kid, though. Fits Penn State really well on and off the field. I mean, he's very similar to a lot of other guys they've gotten in years. All right, Ryan, finishes out. Last one I got here on my list. Uh, I'm going to let you introduce the final prospect. Which one is it? I don't know. We got a couple of guys on there. I, I'll go with Matt. We could talk about Matt Sieg. Yes, I didn't want to say his last name because I didn't I didn't I haven't heard it before. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Matt Sieg had one of the most impressive years really in Pennsylvania high school history. I mean, over 4000 yards, all the stats of like, what was it? 63 touchdowns, I want to say. But here's the thing. He's going to be a safety at the next level. And, and uh, you know, he's playing one a football. So let's see how he progresses. Let's see how he grows. But like this is a kid who grew up. He grew up Penn State. I mean, his father grew up in Center County. Of course, they live out in, in Western PA now. But very impressive athlete. You know, I, I, I once watched him for the 1A game. Wasn't wasn't the best opportunity for me to watch him just because Steel High. Uh, I mean, if Matt Sieg was the was the put it this way, if you're making a top 11 out of that game, Sieg would probably be the one guy from Fort Cherry. And I, and I mean that respectfully, just because Steel High, Steel High had so many other you know great athletes on the field. So it wasn't wasn't an opportunity for him to really open it up, show his athleticism uh, in that game. But I mean, all you got to do is look back on this season and, and um, you know, how, how much he carried his team really throughout the entire year. I mean, he's a special athlete really likes Penn State, will consistently visit Penn State. And, you know, if if the staff wanted to take him early, which I wouldn't be shocked if they did, uh, you know, he's certainly a guy that if he was committed by the start of the next season, it wouldn't shock me. Um, Fitz, are we going to get uh, an unending amount of Trace McSorley comparisons here? No. We're not. Oh, thank, he's a safety. thank goodness. I mean, no. yeah. <laughs> well, I, mean, I, I, I don't know I, if you know, know this. I, know Fitz. Been, I, I don't know if you know this. Past. Trace McSorley was recruited by as a safety by some schools. So, uh, okay, great. great. <laughs> Trace McSorley didn't play one eight ball in Western PA, um, and they made a, a, an unbelievable run uh, through the state playoffs. He was not able to take down Steel High essentially on his own. Um, mm -hmm. but, uh, no, he's a, he's a safety all the way. I think four, four kid at, uh, at camp last year, Ryan. Yeah. Right? We had a great camp. I, I, it was low four, five, five, four, four. Yeah. Something like that. It was very good. You know, one of those guys who I didn't like coming in, I, I knew who he was, but I didn't like that camp was when, when I really realized, oh, wow, he is a, he is a scholarship guy. Like th this is a, this is a player who, who will play at a, at a, at a top program. So. Uh, was very impressed with his with his camp performance, and obviously Penn State was as well. So let's see how he progresses. Long way to go, obviously, but I mean, he makes sense for for an early commitment if, if Penn State's you know wants to go that direction. So a couple of important 2026 guys here on the roster for this upcoming weekend. For the full list, should have said this earlier. As always, bluewhiteillustrated.com is the place to go to get that information. Ryan has been killing it. You can check that that article. He's been updating it all week long. And if you don't have access to it. Yes, you do. Use code PSU1 for two months. You might think January. What's going on? There's no football. We're nine months. Uh-uh. There's always something going on with Penn State football. Recruiting is huge. You get a dollar, uh, two months for a dollar with the special code PSU1 for our podcast and our YouTube audience. So make sure you check out what we got going on over bluewhiteillustrated.com. We got one last question here in the chat from Eric Eisler. Fitz, any interest in Aiden West out of Quince Orchard? Yes, there is interest. Uh, actually, he's coming up this weekend uh, with a bigger group um, that'll be on campus. Um, it, it's a very, I'm not even going to get into it, but he will be on campus this weekend. There is interest. Um, I, I, he's not an offer kid right now that I see, um, but it's it's certainly a really good player. Like it's, uh, it's a guy that we've been aware of for a long time. Of course, playing at Quince Orchard, playing with Xavier Gilliam, playing with, with uh, 
uh, Jalen Harvey. Uh, I don't know why I spaced on that because it's been in the <laughs> back of my mind for two years. Um, but he, he is a very good player. I will say this listed on our site at six foot one sixty five is a bit generous i uh, see he's, he's he's not that uh not that big at least uh, the numbers that we have um so it's going to, that size is going to be an issue there um because and not just size but like cornerback has been really good like cornerback has been a situation where you got to be top of the top for uh to, to get in terry smith's room um we're gonna see what he is uh i i, I would uh, let me say this wouldn't surprise me to see him with an offer um, whether or not he would end up in the class based off of that uh, would probably be a different story. So uh, I know that they they have some offers out regionally that you know are guys that are targets, but not quite targets, if that makes sense. Um, but very curious to see where Aiden West fits into that. We've seen him at camp. I saw him at the uh, Baltimore Under Armour camp last year. Um, good player, certainly. Yeah. Um, but uh, to be a corner, we talked we talked on the top of the show about being a running back at Penn State. Like there's a different standard at running back, tight end, corner of the three that jump out at me um others you know i i can pr- you can probably make an argument for some other spots but those are the three that are just like hey you got to be a dude to be in this room and we're going to see uh see what terry smith thinks of, thinks about that excuse uh, me let me let me add into sure. that real quick uh mm-hmm. they already added xavier thomas right 510 xavier thomas uh, aiden's similar uh with size and skill and things like that so i think terry really will look towards taller uh cornerbacks you know guy, he's going to go national uh it, i think it's pretty clear you know from what we've seen so far he's he's looking for some guys down south um and, but, and, yeah, we'll, we'll and see where I that can, goes if i can plug what i wrote earlier this week jameer joseph mm-hmm. like yes that kid is good he's the guy that kid in the area really good in jersey um he's you know just he's he fits that mitchell um you know Five eleven and a half, close to six foot, but really athletic, really bouncy. Like, uh, and he's got like, I don't want to say Joey Porter arms, but he's got long, long arms. So, Jameer top Joe, five defensive player, twenty twenty five. I, I Can think I get one. Might, put him on the list. I think no, he I'm, is. I'm not gonna make that list. I'm not gonna make that list uh, right now. It's <laughs> don't so worry. Do like I will do that. May. How about I May? will do that for both of you. I will do that. That'll be something I take on. <laughs> Great, but Jameer Joseph, I, I think if you're looking at corners in the region, like that's the guy to look to. Um, and Penn State would love to get him on campus as soon as possible. They've had him on campus before, but uh, getting him back would be a, would be a certainly a big deal. And he's yeah, and-, and he's one of those guys. He's an 88 on on three. He's a four star everywhere else. But I, I think we're that's yeah we're on. behind on that one. He's he might be the top three player in Jersey this cycle. So that's where I'm at. Uh, you can check out Fitz's article over at bluewayillustrated.com. And as always, if you want anyone to do any speculating for you guys, I'm here for it. I'll I'll take all those bullets for you on, uh, especially that, that's what I do here on the YouTube hey, channel. Hey, sometimes. I, 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 I'm not going to toot my own horn here. I got a pretty good track record with D-backs. Yeah. So like uh, it's, uh, okay. you know, we're, we're still playing off the KJ Winston vibes. Um, and some others as well. Uh, John Mitchell. I saw a PFF year. graphic of him the other day of like top five guys. I just, mm-hmm. I, mean, yeah. I almost sent it to you, but I, I made that. Yeah. yeah. That's, um, <laughs> we're on, we're on the off season hype mode, but, uh, no, there's um, John Mitchell last year. Yeah. I, like I, I'm clearly not a defensive back myself, but, uh, there, when, when, when I see one that I really like, I'll, I'll go all in for them. And I think that Jameer Joseph is that guy. It, he might be that guy in 2025. All right. Well, uh, we got a lot of stuff coming up this weekend. Reaction from all of Junior Day on the other side from these guys going out and reaching out to these players and seeing what they thought of Penn State football. So there's always a great reason to stick around here on the Blue White Illustrated YouTube channel and at BlueWhiteIllustrated.com. I'm Thomas Frank Carr for Sean Fitz and Ryan Snyder. We will talk to you later.